Well, everybody is welcome to move forward if they would like. It's, I feel like it's a classroom where everyone always stays in the back of the room. <laughs> um, my name is Chuck Smythe. I'm the director of the Cultural and History Department here at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to another in our November lecture series. Um, this lecture is entitled Paleogenomics, Community Engagement and Evolutionary Histories of Indigenous Peoples of Northwest North America. And I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rupan Mali, who is Richard and Margaret Romano Professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, with affiliations in Anthropology, School of Integrative Biology, and the Carl R. Wuss Institute for Genomic Biology. His research interests include using DNA analysis to infer the evolutionary histories of indigenous peoples of the Americas. Along with his research, Dr. Molly has used his time to help broaden participation in research in STEM fields. He is director of the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics and co-director of the Increasing Diversity in Evolutionary Anthropological Studies programs. Dr. Molly is also editor of the journal Human Biology and associate editor of the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. Today, he will discuss using paleogenomic data to infer the population histories of indigenous communities in Northwest North America, with specific reference to the genomic research results of Shukaka and other ancestors. He will also discuss efforts to broaden participation in genomics research and conduct scientific research in a way that complements traditional knowledge in an indigenous framework through a program to train indigenous community members in genomic research and using genomics as a tool to benefit indigenous communities called the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Molly. Thank you. So I want to thank uh, Chuck and Rosita and the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute for inviting me to give uh, this talk. Um, I'm honored to be a part of this November series. So it looks like we have a, a, a uh, a good sized group here, so we, maybe we can be a little bit more informal and I can answer uh, questions uh, throughout the talk if I'm not explaining thing as, things as well as I could have. Um, so I've been at the University of Illinois now for 12 years, um, but the way I want to start off this talk is by uh, discussing an experience that I had in graduate school uh, back in... 1998. Uh, I went to graduate school at the University of California in Davis, uh, and I was in the Department of Anthropology. And I was able to, to dig up uh, an old picture of me uh, back in graduate school where I, I look a lot younger. Um, this is me 20 years ago when I was in my mid-20s. And for my dissertation research, I was uh, studying Native American, uh, the genetic diversity among Native Americans. And uh, what was interesting about this project is that all of the samples from the indigenous people had already been collected by my advisor. And so um, the, the DNA samples were stored in freezers in the lab. And so for the first few years of my research, I never left the lab. I was just um, analyzing samples that existed in the lab, uh, sequencing their DNA. Uh, and so it wasn't until a few years into my research um, dissertation program that uh, an archaeologist who was also a member of a Native American tribe in Northern California uh, invited me to give a talk at her tribe um, on my research and potentially collect um, samples to be a part of my study. Um, I was very excited about this opportunity and uh, eagerly accepted the invitation. And so the day I went to go get my talk, I brought with me a large bag full of cheek swabs because I was certain that once I presented my research and asked, what, um, asked them if they wanted to be involved and explained why 
the research would be better with their involvement, um, I was certain that I would collect lots of samples. And so when I went to the tribe, uh, I gave my presentation, and there were about oh, um, a dozen or so people in the audience. And then I gave my pitch on why they should be involved in the research. I was met by silence. And then an elderly gentleman in the audience said something that I'll never forget. He said, why should we trust you? And then he told me about stories about how past researchers have come to tribes, collected uh, samples for research and left and never came back to report results, never visited the community again. So uh, needless to say, I did not collect any DNA samples on that visit. Um, but that experience uh, impacted me the way I uh, wanted to conduct my research and work with indigenous communities on genetic research. So um, that uh, unethical uh, research practice is not a thing of the past. It still happens today. And a, a good example is from the Havasupai case. Uh, it's been called the Havasupai case. Um, and in this, um, uh, in this case, there, were, uh, there, there was a researcher, uh, Dr. Therese Markow at the University of Arizona, <coughs> who collected samples um, from members of the Havasupai tribe. Now, members of the Havasupai tribe, uh, this happened in the 90s, uh, were suffering from a higher rate of type 2 diabetes. And so the proposed research that Dr. Marco suggested was identifying the genetic underpinnings of type 2 diabetes. So after obtaining the samples, uh, Dr. Marco, uh, in her lab, not only um, did genetic studies on um, type 2 diabetes, but also on schizophrenia, and also passed around some of the samples to other labs that had nothing to do with type 2 diabetes. Um, and so in the informed consent that the participants signed, it was largely for studies of um, disease. And so uh, this was a breach of that informed consent. So when members of the Havasupai found out about all of this research that was done, they were justifiably upset and they filed a lawsuit against Dr. Markow and the Arizona Board of Regents. Now this um, lawsuit was set, settled out of court uh, a few years later for $700,000 uh, plus benefits to, to the community, plus the repatriation of the blood samples that were originally taken by Dr. Markow. And this picture right here is a photo of Havasupai community members um, uh, saying a prayer before they are repatriating the blood samples. Now, uh, I do my research in a very different way. Uh, I uh, focused on community-based research. And so um, a few months ago, my colleagues developed uh, this figure that we published in the paper earlier this year. And what I really love about this figure it is, is that it displays um, the ways that we try and do our research in our lab. Uh, we're at the center of the research is not the lab, but the indigenous community that we're partnering with. Uh, and then we have uh, various principles that we try to employ in our genetics research, uh, like equity, respect, beneficence, and reciprocity. And then we have protocols that we engage in during our research. Um, during the, the time that we're doing the research, like transparency, where uh, participants and community members know about all the research that we're doing with any samples that we collect from them. Um, where uh, we often come back to the community uh, and report on the latest results, ask about any um, uh, suggestions for uh, the way we should pursue the research based on the results and their uh, informed about all of the research. Uh, cultural competency is another um, protocol that we employ. So if you are a research member that's not a part of the indigenous community, uh, we make sure that uh, the researchers understand the history of the uh, communities and their relations to the land. 
Uh, dissemination is another protocol where indigenous community uh, members or designated members of the community uh, will review and be able to edit, suggest changes to manuscripts before they are published and disseminated to the community. Um, and then capacity building. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about capacity building because we've been uh, fairly successful uh, in this area. And this is specifically capacity building in science and in genomics. So um, Chuck mentioned the, the SING program, which is the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics program. This program is largely a one-week workshop where um, that's led by indigenous scholars and scientists and non-indigenous scientists like myself who work with indigenous communities. And we have an application process where uh, Native American students, community members, uh, and scholars will apply to be a part of this program. And those that are um, accepted um, have their funding and travel and week stay uh, wherever the workshop is held um, paid for. And during that week, uh, we discuss how science can be done within an indigenous framework. We have hands-on training um, on uh, genetics and genomics and molecular biology uh, and bioinformatics. And we have discussions on the ethical, legal, social implications of genomic research with indigenous communities. <coughs> so just to give you a flavor of what the workshop is like, uh, we have a, I have a few pictures. So here is a picture of uh, participants in the molecular biology lab, extracting their own DNA if they want to. Uh, if they don't want to, they can extract uh, uh, instructors or TAs or, or just observe. Uh, and then they analyze that DNA. Um, and then uh, we have the computational genomics or bioinformatics lab, where participants are analyzing hundreds of thousands of DNA markers to learn about genetic structure. Um, and, uh, uh, how you can use uh, genetic information. Uh, we have lots of uh, engaging lectures by experts. So this is uh, Dr. Kim Tallbear, who's at the University of Alberta um, lecturing, uh, Dr. Jessica Bardell in the middle, and Dr. Deborah Bolnick, all discussing ways of using genomics data. And then, of course, we have lots of discussions on the ethics and social implications of genomic research and um, how it may um, uh, be, uh, be similar to indigenous um, ways and uh, may, in ways that it might be different. So since 2011, we've had uh, workshops um, almost every year, and we've had over 100 graduates from the program, from uh, community members all across North America, including Alaska, uh, and um, in uh, Hawaii, and then also including uh, uh, individuals from New Zealand, uh, from the Maori community. Uh, so SING, which started in 2011 in, at the University of Illinois, has expanded uh, over the years. So now there is a SING Canada uh, at the, that's run by Dr. Kim Talder at the University of Alberta. Uh, and there's a SING Aotearoa, uh, in New Zealand that's run by Maui Hudson. And in 2016, we actually ended up forming uh, the SING Consortium by some graduates of the program and the faculty of the program to comment on genetic research that's been taking place and help create policy for genetic research with indigenous communities. Uh, so earlier this year, we were able to publish a, a commentary on a research study done at Chaco Canyon um, last year, where the researchers analyzed ancient individuals from the Southwest at Chaco Canyon, uh, but did not engage or consult or even talk to any indigenous community members uh, in the Southwest. We talked about the problems with that. A few <clears throat> months later, we were able to publish a, a larger piece a policy forum piece in science where we talked about advancing the ethics of paleogenomics. Uh, and the, the tagline for this article is that ancestral remains should be regarded not as artifacts, uh, but as human relatives who deserve respect. So we uh, 
talk about how uh, research will be improved by working with indigenous communities and propose um, ways of doing that for, um, for paleogenetic researchers working with ancient DNA. Uh, and then a few months later, we were able to publish this overall framework for um, ethical research working with indigenous communities that highlighted that figure that I showed earlier of, um, of on community-based research. So about a month ago, uh, Lizzie Wade is a reporter for science, and she came to the SING workshop when it was in Seattle um, and, and spent the week with us and then wrote up an article. Uh, and I think the quote that Kim Tallbear gave for that article sums up um, my thoughts on the way you should be doing community-based research with genetics. So if you're going to work with indigenous communities on genetics, you have to be willing to make lifelong relations. And so I, I strongly uh, believe that's the case. So now before going into the ancient DNA or paleogenomics research, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the history of ancient DNA and paleogenomics. So this is, when I talk about ancient DNA, I'm talking about extracting uh, DNA from a tissue um, from an ancient organism or individual. Uh, and this could be skeletal remains, this could be um, ancient hair, uh, the um, uh, copper lights or ancient poop is actually very um, sought after these days because it gives you the information not only on the individual but on diet and and their microbiome, their gut microbiome. But ancient DNA actually started off, in the, the field started off in the 80s uh, when the technology developed to be able to take very low concentration, um, uh, small amounts of DNA, and amplify it up into millions of copies that it could actually be analyzed. Uh, and so this happened, this technology happened in the 80s, and then by the 90s, lots of different labs or trying to extract ancient DNA from different organisms. And there was a particular fascination with extracting DNA from dinosaurs for some reason. Uh, and so in 1994, a paper was published in Science by Scott Woodward and colleagues at Brigham Young University about being able to extract DNA from a dinosaur bone. Uh, and so this was published and like with most science research articles, as soon as it's published, a bunch of other researchers download that data and analyze it to see if they can support what the original paper said or to find flaws in the, find flaws in the analysis. And so this was done with this paper and um, Blair Hedges and a colleague downloaded the, uh, the data and tried to put it in a phylogenetic context or a, an evolutionary context. And if we think about dinosaurs and who are living dinosaurs today, uh, most research would suggest, anyone have a guess? Of what, what taxon or what birds, <coughs> right? Most people would think of birds, right? And so the analysis that was done showed that this dinosaur bone was most closely related to humans, not birds. So does this mean that dinosaurs and humans are related? Probably not. This is likely a case of contamination because the DNA, if it exists in a sample, is in such low concentration and damage that um, it can be overwhelmed by contaminating, contaminating DNA from the researcher from, or from other um, reagents or tubes or anything else that's in the lab. Right? So uh, this uh, paper was likely not dinosaur DNA, but human contamination. This trend with dinosaur DNA continued for a few more years, and another lab at the University of Alabama <clears throat> got a DNA sequence that looked like it was from a turkey. Right? Uh, but this research wasn't published in a paper. The uh, researchers just talked about it at a conference. And they talked about how the problem was the DNA sequence was an exact match to a turkey. And you wouldn't expect that after 60 million years of evolution. You would expect at least a few differences. And so the researchers talked about how before doing the DNA extraction and the lab work, 
they were eating turkey sandwiches in the lab. <laughs> so this is probably another case of contamination with turkey sandwiches. <coughs> you shouldn't have eaten the lab, by the way. Um, so DNA and the early history of this field had a very rocky start. And after that, it became very difficult to publish ancient DNA research unless you had specified, very stringent protocols that um, you adhered to. And that made DNA research, very, ancient DNA research, very expensive uh, and also very time consuming. And so at the University of Illinois, we have specialized rooms. We have an ancient DNA room, which is a clean room where that's positively pressured as HEPA filtered to air, and we have these uh, hoods that get rid of any air after um, uh, working with a sample. And so we have specialized facilities, and then we also have specialized protocols, like uh, researchers have to um, go into an ante room and put on this Tyvek suit, I call it a bunny suit, uh, before they go into the uh, ancient lab to do any kind of work. And so these are protocols that we take um, um, cautions with to uh, minimize and prevent contamination and detect it if it does occur. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention about ancient DNA research and uh, paleogenomics research is that uh, there have been rapid advances that have happened since around the year 2010. So before the year 2010 and with some of my dissertation research that happened in the early 2000s, we were limited to analyzing the mitochondrial genome. Now the mitochondrial genome is found in the mitochondria of a cell. Um, and you probably all remember that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It gives us our energy. And there are multiple mitochondrial genomes in a cell. And so there are lots of copies of the mitochondrial genome in an individual. Whereas this is the nuclear genome and there's only uh, two copies right, that you get from your mother and your father. So back before 2010, we were just limited to analyzing a small, you know, 600 segment portion of DNA that was informative in the mitochondrial genome, but we couldn't analyze the whole mitochondrial genome. And rarely would you be able to analyze any of the nuclear genome, your main genome that consists of 3.2 billion segments. Uh, but since 2010, there have been advances in computational genetics and sequencing to where now in my lab, uh, my students do, they can complete my dissertation in a week. Uh, they are able to sequence complete mitochondrial genomes, all 16,569 segments or so. And if the DNA is well, uh, well enough preserved in an ancient individual, they'll be able to sequence all of the 3.2 million segments, 3.2 billion segments of the nuclear genome. So for the paleogenomics research that I want to begin to discuss, I want to start off by talking about my partnership with uh, the Coast Simpson First Nations uh, on the north coast of British Columbia. And here is an aerial view of the town Prince Rupert. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have, have been there. Uh, and um, since the 1960s, uh, up through a few years ago, ancient individuals have been excava excavated from the ground and removed uh, um, in large part because of the ports that have been built in Prince Rupert. And some of these ancient individuals have been um, moved to the Canadian Museum of Civilizations where I uh, worked with um, uh, the curator uh, Jerry Sibolsky who has been working with um, the Melakawa and Lakwalan First Nations for about 30 years. And he was the one who introduced me to these communities. Uh, and so we decided to work together to use genomics as a tool to analyze um, the, these ancestors. Um, and specifically, we decided that we wanted to find any genetic links between uh, the these ancient individuals and the members of the descendant communities, uh, and also to investigate the impacts of European colonizations on the genomes of these communities over time. 
Yeah, I just want to point out before getting into the research that this is a team effort. Uh, this isn't just me. This isn't just my lab. This involves a lot of people. It involves uh, the partnering communities. Uh, and here's Barbara Petzold, who, who works for the Metlakala First Nation. Um, it involves other academic colleagues. So this is uh, Mike DeGiorgio, who's at Pencils, Pennsylvania State University, who does a lot of the bioinformatics uh, work on, on these projects. So the first study that I want to discuss is a, st a study where we were trying to um, investigate the impacts of European colonization. And so this study was largely done by uh, John Lindo, who was a graduate student in my lab at the time. Now he's Dr. John Lindo, and he's a professor at um, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and so we did this work with uh, the Melakala First Nation and the Lakalans First Nation. Here's a picture of the Melakala Health Clinic when it first opened. Uh, and so for this project, we uh, examined exomes from individuals. And you guys are probably like, what's an exome? An exome is the coding region of the genome. So it involves all 20,000 or so genes that are sequenced. Uh, it involves about 60 million segments of DNA per individual. So we analyzed 25 exomes from living um, members of these communities, the descendant communities, and 25 ancient or exomes from ancient individuals prior to European contact to look at before and after and identify any changes that happened between those before European contact and after European contact. Now, before we get into the analysis, one of the things we did after getting the DNA sequence was make sure that we weren't doing the dinosaur DNA project. We wanted to make sure that we weren't sequencing ourselves, that we did not sequence contamination. So, we did a number of analyses, but I'm just going to point out two of them. Uh, the first is called a principal components analysis. And here's a plot of the principal components analysis. And the way this analysis works is that the genomic information of each individual is represented by a dot or a symbol. And the closer the two symbols are together, the closer the genetic similarity of the data for these two individuals. And so you can see all the ancient individuals from Prince Rupert are in black, and they are clustering with other Native American individuals that have had uh, their um, genomic data analyzed. And when you look at the uh, Cosimption First Nations, uh, they are in green, and you can see that they also largely cluster with the ancient individuals but some of them are being pulled towards this blue cluster, and this blue cluster actually represents individuals from Europe or have European ancestry. And so some of these uh, Cosimption individuals have European ancestors uh, that resulted after European contact. And so these individuals are being pulled a little bit more. The closer they are to the European cluster, the more European ancestors that they have. So the other so it's, it, was, it was nice to see this clustering here. The other analysis is a tree analysis, called a tree mix analysis. And it looks at the relationships of groups based off of trees. And you can see that once we take into account this European um, ancestors in the Cosimption, the Prince Rupert ancient individuals are closest to the Cosimption. Uh, so, <clears throat> we also did other analyses to confirm that we had ancient DNA, uh, looking at DNA damage. Uh, but I'm not going to bore you with that analysis. So once we uh, completed this quality control, we then uh, created demographic models and found the dem demographic model that fit our data the, the best. And that is a model that shows um, a population bottleneck or a population collapse that happened around 200 years ago. And at this time, you see over a 50% reduction in effective population size, or a loss of a lot, about half of the diversity in the population. And if you look at uh, historical records and uh, oral histories, 
This is about the same time you find smallpox epidemics happening in this region of British Columbia. Uh, after completing the demographic model, then what we did is we scanned this genomic data to look for genes that had variants that changed dramatically from before contact to after contact uh, as a result of natural selection. And so we found uh, one gene that had a number of variants that showed the signal of selection. And so this was a gene called HLA-DQ-alpha-1, and this is a gene that's often related to immune function or immunity. And we can see that the selection happened on the ancient individuals, and that is uh, these ancient individuals had variants that seemed to be um, uh, beneficial and uh, adapted to the environment. But then after European contact and the change in the environment and the introduction of um, new diseases and other changes that happened at that time, uh, when we run our models, we find that the model that best fit the data is where you have positive selection or variants that are adapted to the environment before contact, but then after contact, these variants were no longer um, adaptive and may um, have lost the beneficial effects that they had. And that's this model right here. So you have a model that is adapted before but not after European contact. So I'll summarize this research in a bit. Uh, but what I want to do next is talk about how we, in another study, we looked at another genomic region. This time we looked at the mitochondrial genome. And the mitochondrial genome uh, is inherited in a special way, different from our nuclear genome. In our nuclear genome, we all get half from our mother and half from our father. Everyone here got their mitochondrial genome from their mother and none from their father. So if this is you, you got your mitochondrial genome from your mother and not from your father. And if you go back two generations, that traces one of four ancestors, your grandparents, it traces your mother's mother, but not the other three ancestors. If you go back four generations, it traces one of eight ancestors. So in the end, it traces your mother's 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 line. And so we decided to look at this genome uh, in part because uh, the groups that we're looking at um, were matrilocal and had a matrilineal system. And we found a few connections. Uh, again, this work was done by Dr. Yinchu Kui in my lab, who's now a professor at Jilin University, and uh, again, um, John Lindo. So the first connection was interesting because uh, the ancient individual that showed a connection was actually from the Lucy Islands off the coast of British Columbia, about an hour boat ride. Uh, and we find that an uh, individual that lived on Lucy Islands about 5,000 years ago had a mitochondrial uh, genome that was very similar to another ancient individual that lived uh, in the Prince Rupert Inner Harbor about 2,500 years ago. And this ancient individual had the exact same mitochondrial genome as a consumption First Nation individual. And so that was interesting to see, especially because these mitochondrial genomes in general are rare. And so in order to see this connection, uh, we weren't expecting this. Uh, we saw another connection, which was more of uh, the kind of connection that we expected to see. And that is an ancient mitochondrial genome from a person who lived about 5,000 years ago. Uh, had a similar mitochondrial genome, not only to uh, Assumption First Nation, uh, but also neighboring communities, uh, the Niska speakers and, and Haida speakers. And, and this is more of what you would expect because intermarriage um, and exchange um, of mates have been happening for thousands of years, and so you might expect to find these mitochondrial genomes distributed. So the, the Metlakala First Nation, they were, they were pleased with, with these results. And um, uh, in an article, Barbara Petzl is quoted as saying, uh, having a DNA link 
showing direct maternal ancestry dating back at least 5,000 years is huge as far as helping the Melakawa prove that the territory was theirs over the millennia. So that was uh, interesting, fi interesting to find, but there was one genetic link uh, that uh, I did not discuss, that I want to discuss now, uh, where a 6,000-year-old, an individual who lived about 6,000 years ago on Lucy Islands, didn't have any connections with any living uh, com community members today, but had a connection with an ancient individual who, uh, who lived about 10,000 years ago at Prince of Wales Island. Um, and this individual was named Shuka Ka. So I want to talk a little bit about the partnership on the scientific analysis of Shuka Ka. Uh, I became involved in uh, the genomic analysis, uh, at first as um, someone who was helping with the analysis, and then more, one, and then later on more as the, the direct genomic um, person doing the analysis. Um, and so some of this information um, I'm going to have to refer to um, Rosita and others to make sure that I'm, I'm getting the story right. <clears throat> so uh, Shukaka was identified in 1996. Uh, in a cave uh, called Anirni's Cave. Um, and what was interesting about uh, this partnership is that as soon as this ancient individual was identified, uh, the, the forest ranger or the researcher who researchers who identified it immediately contacted the, uh, the local indigenous communities to inform them about this um, ancient individual. Um, and left it to the ancient individual, uh, to, left it to the communities to decide what to do next with this ancient individual. Um, uh, I'll talk about what happened in, in the meantime, but eventually uh, Shukaka was reburred in 2008, and I, I believe there were um, celebrations that happened at that time. So after the identification of this ancient individual, uh, the uh, Klawak Cooperative Association and uh, Craig Community Association adopted a resolution 986-5, 96-6, respectively, allowing for radiocarbon dating of this ancient individual um, to identify uh, the age that this individual lived and the non-destructive scientific analysis of this individual, more morphological analyses to a help infer the age, uh, sex, and other aspects of this individual's life. And most importantly, the resolutions called for oversight of the scientific analysis by the indigenous communities. Uh, it was in 2004 uh, that the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute adopted a resolution 2004-04 that allowed for the ancient DNA analysis of another tooth from Shukaka, uh, and also in this resolution, oversight by the indigenous communities involved of the scientific analysis that was done. So in 2007, uh, Brian Kemp, who uh, led the analysis, genomic analysis of Shukaka, Dr. Brian Kemp is uh, now, uh, he just moved to University of Oklahoma in Norman, um, where he continues to do this type of research. Um, he was able to remember this was before 2010, so we were focused on analyzing a small portion of the mitochondrial genome, and we were able to also uh, analyze a portion of the Y chromosome genome. We were able to, we were able to show that uh, this ancient individual contained uh, mitochondrial DNA in a lineage that was found widely in living community members in um, the Americas, uh, all the way down to the tip of South America, um, uh, in Patagonia. And so it had this mitochondrial lineage that was found widely across the Americas, and a Y chromosome also that was found widely in Native Americans. Uh, but after we identified this genetic link at Lucy Island with this ancient individual 6,000 years ago at Shukaka. Uh, I talked with Brian about the possibility of analyzing any of the tooth remnants from this analysis 
um, to do the whole genome. And so uh, Brian got in touch with folks up here uh, and confirmed commissions for the genomic analysis, not just the mitochondrial DNA, then the small sections, but to try and sequence the nuclear genome and the entire genome. Uh, and after we got confirmation that we could proceed, we did the analysis and published a study last year uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where we were able to show uh, genetic continuity from 10,000 years um, to present day involving three other ancient individuals from uh, the Prince Rupert area. And so I'll just briefly talk about this study now. Uh, so for the mitochondrial DNA, we have mitochondrial lineages that are named. Uh, they're very not imaginatively named. They're kind of boring names. Uh, lineage A2, we find up to about 5,000 years. And then at Lucy Island, we have an, a lineage that matched what we found at Shukaka. Uh, we wanted to sequence the nuclear genomes of these ancient individuals and a living descendant community member to see if we can see uh, whether we see the same pattern of this break in about 6,000 years or if we see continuity. And so we performed the analysis, and this is a bunch of numbers up here that's not probably going to make too much sense, but I want you to focus here that if you turn these into percentages, we were able to sequence a large portion of three ancient individuals from Prince Rupert, uh, but because Shukaka was uh, older and likely more degraded, we were able to sequence about 6% of its nuclear genome. And, but because the nuclear genome is 3.2 billion segments long, that's still a lot of data and allowed us to do the analysis that we wanted to do we were able to show this continuity from Shukaka to the ancient individual from Lucy Island 6,000 years ago to an ancient individual um, in Prince Rupert at around 2,500 years ago, 1,750 years ago, to a present-day community member. And so um, overall, for the Northwest Coast, so far the data that we have is that there is regional con genetic continuity since 10,300 years ago. Uh, there is a large population collapse in British Columbia following European contact that reduced the diversity of these um, uh, uh, of this uh, population before and after European contact. And there's evidence of selection on an immune-related genomic region in uh, the British Columbia Coast Ocean First Nation communities. So. Um, what I want to do now is today is an interesting day because uh, there are three new studies on paleogenomics on the Americas that were just published today. And I, I knew about these just because I was involved in one of them and um, heard about the others and were able to read some of the others. Uh, but the news on these studies are coming out now. Uh, and if you check your news feed on Google, you'll probably see um, uh, stories about these studies. And so I just briefly wanted to go over each of these studies to give an idea of, of what we're learning from them uh, and where we are now. Um, so the first study uh, was conducted uh, by um, a team that included John Lindo, who was uh, before in my lab, uh, but now is at Emory University and uh, was involved in the Shukaka analysis. Uh, here he was uh, able to work with South American communities in the Andes. Uh, and he had seven ancient individuals and living community, descendant communities that he analyzed. And he was able to show again in the Andes 7,000 years of genetic continuity. So here we have 10,000 years. There we have at least 7,000 years. That, and there's probably, could be more if there were older ancient individuals that were identified. Um, he was also able to do a selection scan on the genome, and he was able to find an adaptation to starch digestion that they're inferring might be related, related to um, the diet of starting to eat tubers uh, in the Andes. And he also found a large population decline after European contact. 
What's interesting about this study is that he looked at the highlands at the uh, Aymara communities, and they experienced a, a smaller population decline compared to the lowland communities. Uh, there's another paper that came out today as well uh, by um, a group at an, another international group. Uh, Nathan Nakasuka uh, is actually a Singh alumni. Um, or a Singh alumnus. Uh, and so there was some indigenous efforts in this paper, but I think it was largely led by David Reich, who's even farther down on the, on the list, um, and he's not an indigenous researcher. He's a researcher at Harvard. Uh, so in this paper, they were again um, able to identify several regions in South America where you have this long-term genetic continuity from 9,000 years ago to, to um, uh, near present day. Right. Uh, and they also identified early numerous movements into South America from North America that were previously not known about um, based off of archaeological information. Uh, may have been known about from moral histories, but um, that's not well documented, that's not well studied in science. Uh, and then there is another paper that sequenced 15 ancient individuals from Alaska to Patagonia. And again, showed these multiple movements from North America into South America during the initial peopling. Uh, and also showed genetic continuity in the Great Basin from um, an individual named, um, uh, that was found in Spirit Cave um, to near the, the present day. And so what we're finding with these three studies is that before today, there are about 40 ancient individuals in the Americas with genome-wide genetic data. After these three studies, there are about 110 ancient individuals in the Americas with genome-wide data. Now, um, all three of them uh, consulted with indigenous communities, and the communities supported this research which is a positive. This wasn't like the Chaco Canyon case where the researchers didn't even talk to any indigenous communities. But none of the studies were really led by an indigenous scientist. So Nathan Nakasuka is native Hawaiian and he was greatly involved in the research, but it was mainly led by his advisor, David Wright at Harvard. So, there still is a need for the Singh program and training indigenous scientists to be leaders in genomics and paleogenomics. And so at Singh, we often talk about indigenous-driven genomic research. And so this model of indigenous-driven genomic research includes project ideas and hypotheses from within the community, right? not, not from non-indigenous people outside the community. Uh, project aims based on indigenous philosophies and concepts within an indigenous framework. Uh, the communities ha uh, have the expertise to conduct the research and analysis and to interpret the results and synthesize these, these results with traditional knowledge uh, and to have project results that directly benefit indigenous community members and are disseminated to the community members first before um, publishing and, and disseminating to the broader public. So uh, we, we think that this will happen, and I actually have a, um, a student, a graduate student who's conducting um, uh, um, genetic research, on her, and she's doing the project largely on her own in um, collaboration with communities, and I know of other young indig indigenous genomicists that are doing the same. But I'm going to make a plug here. Uh, if you know of indigenous students or scientists that are interested in genetics, the SING program is still running. So this summer in 2019, it's going to be back at the University of Illinois. Uh, and you can just go to this website and you can fill out an application. So if you know anyone, um, they can fill out an application here and the page discusses the program. Applications are open until January 31st, uh, and we would love to see community members from up here apply for the program to be a part of it. Uh, this 
summer, the, the focus of the workshop is going to be on historic trauma and epigenetics. And so if you know folks that have an interest in that, um, they should apply. And with that, uh, I want to acknowledge the many people that are involved with this research, as well as the funding agencies, and I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks. Chuck. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminding myself that I need to repeat your question so it's recorded uh, since you're not mic'd. Uh, so uh, you asked about learning a little bit more about the selection on the immune related gene uh, in the coast simpson communities before contact and after contact. Uh, so there were um, variants that were found not within the coding region of the gene, but actually a little bit upstream from the coding region, and that means that it's regulatory. So it helps define uh, how much of that gene is expressed and how much protein it produces. And so there seems to have been the uh, change that happened before contact and after contact in the regulation of that gene and how much of uh, that gene is expressed, producing that protein associated with um, immune function. Um, there are ways to do more functional analyses to get exactly of what the variants are doing. Uh, and um, John Lindo, I think, is planning that research, but uh, we, don't, we don't have that. Um, we haven't done that research yet. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment um, that um, for the most part, Native Americans have not been, uh, or they've been adverse to the DNA study. And uh, I, I served as a uh, chair of the NAGPRO, the Native American Race Protection and Repatriation uh, Review Committee, uh, for about 12 years. And throughout the country, uh, Native Americans were absolutely opposed to DNA studies. And I would say that um, the Southeast Natives were among the first to really accept uh, doing DNA studies. And it really started with uh, Chukapa, and that was a name that we gave him, Chukapa, uh, our ancestors. And it, it was a project um, uh, with scientists, but we were able to put on, um, where did she go? Yarrow, there she is. Yarrow. Yarrow was one of our, I guess, our first intern that worked on that, on that study with uh, the other scientists, Jared Fikeo and Jim Dixon, uh -huh. primarily. And uh, we did a film on it, and I always remember Yarrow saying, that you know, we had discussed this, this idea of doing research with our elders. And it was our elders who really said that they wanted to, to learn. This young man had offered himself to us so that we could learn. And that was something that she said, you know, on TV. We did it, I mean, on our, our video. We did a, a video of that. So I always wanted to acknowledge Yara, you know, for bringing that out into the open and making that statement public. And it comes from our cultural value that uh, we name Chupapa after, uh, Hashupa. And Hashupa means uh, we're tied to our ancestors and we have an obligation to our future generation. So that was a cultural value in action and adapted to a new situation of doing DNA studies. And, um, you, uh, and for us, it really validated uh, one of our sayings, and that is the belief from our oral tradition that we have lived here in our homeland since time immemorial. We just didn't have a date on it. And so we were we were really happy, you know, when the first studies came out, it didn't show a direct link to living population and that, you know, any number of reasons for that. But uh, I, I would say that since then, um, it, we started to have discussions in the Native American community 
uh, NCAI knows a poem at ONAC where we came and studied and uh, talked about it. And some tribes were in favor of it and others weren't. And I remember we showed our film at the NAGPRA Review Committee and I got beat up by other Native American tribes and said they demanded equal time. And I said, absolutely, you know, you're going to do a film to a film. But um, I'm really pleased, you know, that I think we let, led the, uh, the way from the Southeast Natives into opening this door to science so that we're learning more about our history, our ancient history. And I would say if we had done that earlier, we, we, I don't know, maybe we wouldn't have had all of that controversy around Kennewick Man where we had to prove, you know, that he, we had to prove he was Native American. So I, I think, you know, this work is just absolutely very exciting. Uh, I, I, I want to get more of our younger people uh, into this kind of science, but as I said, we have just now begun to open that door to this kind of research. Uh, I also want to applaud you in your model, the same model, because um, one of the problems that we've had, and we, we uh, absolutely, you know, there's no scientist that come, can come into our country and do DNA studies without the direct engagement of our people. Uh, right, right, primarily to the tribe. And we have, we have to approve of the consent forms. And I know there was one study that came in, they had a consent form, and uh, we looked at it and said it wasn't acceptable to us. And they were all were hysterical and saying, well, we won't be able to do the research uh, if, you, if you don't approve and use our consent form. And we just said, well, I'm sorry, you know, this, this is our, our policy. And this is the way it's going to happen, or not at all. And it didn't happen. So that, that university went back and changed its consent form and included our ideas. But we have had some uh, misfortunes, unfortunately, where uh, we've had a scientist that we allowed to come in and uh, take samples from our people at celebration. And we're still waiting for, for the data. And uh, so we have to be more vigilant about that and, and making sure that, you know, I don't know, uh, is there a funding, there's some relationship between the funding and their reporting back you know, to the university. So I really want to applaud you, you know, for leading this effort this thing and making sure that uh, indigenous people are involved and, uh, and then also get their, their results back. So, and you saw me there listed as an author. They asked me if I'd be an author, and I said, I can't even tell you to read the article. <laughs> 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 because, you know, I, was in, I helped out in, in orchestrating uh, some of the work. They were kind enough to put my name on there, but I was kind of embarrassed about it. I said, I could barely pronounce some of those words. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Tell us what you think. Yeah. Thank you for um, that introduction and acknowledgement. You know, it's, it's been it's been a lot of years, and um, I've I've tried to follow this um, throughout all of it. And, and I had planned to ask actually about that research because you know I thought you know maybe um, you know we kept checking in online and looking and seeing if anything had come through and trying to keep track of that little code they gave us after how many years it finally got filed away in some safe place, right? And so we kind of kind of let that go. And like you were saying, you know, it, it leads to a mistrust, right? Of, of what did they do with that information? And where did that go? And was, you know, the data that they, that they, that they studied just, it didn't, did it not, prove what they were wanting to, and so they didn't find it valuable enough to share it back with us, was, was kind of what I felt personally. Um, so I've been reluctant to participate in some, but, but I've done a lot of reading and, and looking into some more of the more modern texts as they're coming along and, and questioning, you know, how can we, you know, make some of these connections um, with the modern population? And, and I know that there's a concern that there aren't enough samples, so that when we go in and we go online and we try to take a DNA test and we come back, there aren't enough of the samples to come back with a viable result, right? So how do we fix 
fix that? What do we do? You know, how can we as a group, you know, want to want to pursue information and we're curious about our our origins and background and tracking and um, you know what 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 are your recommendations <clears throat> that I, I heard you I heard you talking about the um, the matrilineal line and that fascinates me. Right. And so what are the differences then between that matrilineal line and the patrilineal line and you know if there was something along those lines what what would you recommend? Right. So so the question uh, is about, um, I think about database biases and how there's a lack of indigenous uh, people's DNA in these databases and that's going to bias any kind of result that you get. So I'll, I'll talk about this in two perspectives. One is on population and evolutionary history. So if you submit a sample to 23andMe, for example, their database of um, indigenous peoples in the Americas is very tiny. And so any result you get back is going to be extremely biased. So they have the, the conservative analysis and they have the liberal analysis. And so you get very different values based on the analyses that you do because the database is so small for indigenous peoples. There's an, uh, another concern with health genomics. And there's, you guys have probably heard the um, the term precision health or precision medicine. Uh, and so that's largely based on personalized genomics about sequencing your genome and using variants to help identify um, potential diseases that one might be more susceptible to or um, uh, can uh, be um, can guard against. Uh, and so with these analyses, and even for that database for health genomics, indigenous people are very, very underrepresented. And so in the U.S., there's really not much being done um, by the National Institutes of Health right now. There's a program called the All of Us Program, but it is um, not doing the, well, it's not doing the best consultation with indigenous communities. Uh, in Canada, there was a project that was just funded by um, Genome Canada called the Silent Genomes Project. And that is a project where there's a plan, and that's led by Laura Arbor at University of Victoria. Um, and I'm a co-advisor um, on that. And there's a plan to sequence genomes of many First Nation individuals from throughout Canada. But there's a governance system of First Nation um, people that are overseeing the research and how that data is going to be used and analyzed. So there's a nice governance, governance system before any sample is even collected or analyzed. Um, so I would suggest that indigenous community, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a few years I imagine there's going to be expertise in these communities to um, help create your own database and program. Um, and uh, don't, you know, I think there's time to, to wait um, and not do the research um, with uh, a non-indigenous person for precision genetics or health genomics. Or if you're gonna do the research with an outsider, make sure that they are intimately involved in doing the research in a community-based way. Yes. Mm -hmm. I had prediction uh, actually related to the man we found in the prediction. Mm -hmm. And I was allowed to see a bunch of your breakfast in a lot of people instead of the hatch. Then the second time, they, they gave me permission that it was really restricted. Uh, they actually, Alan Frankenstein did the documentary. And you couldn't even use the picture of the cat in the film. They meant nobody there is related. The only people related to that man are David Hyde and Bunny Hula. And yet you have no access to that cat. And that that meant it's really troubling to me. So I don't know how we would get past that. Yeah. So in, in thinking about the genetic analysis of that um, ancestor. Um, 
So that was done before 2010. I think that was done in about 2001 or 2002, I believe. And so the researchers were restricted to analyzing that small portion of the mitochondrial genome. And so that's informative and it can tell you relationships, um, but only of the individuals that have been sampled. And there are probably lots of individuals that have not been sampled. So, I mean, I, if, if you were sampled and you showed a link and you're related, that's great. But that doesn't mean that there are other people that are not related that weren't sampled. Um, and so, um, as far as the uh, the, uh, the hat and, and the, the protections of viewing and, and recording that, the hat, I'm not sure. Um, that's not my area of expertise. So. Uh, I'll talk to others who know more about that. <laughs> Probably you. You have a, the best idea of how to do that. <laughs> I mean, I suppose it's possible. I, I don't know much about um, that case other than what I've read. Um, but, you know, it, it would have to be, I think it would be uh, difficult to get a consensus to, to get an additional sample from an ancestor that's been reburied. Um, I, I suppose. I'm not sure. That was a, a study of a 600 year old man that was found on the ice, and it turned out it was, um, we thought he was a coastal blanket, the inland blanket thought he was a inland blanket, and we actually went up there, um, uh, some of us from the Chilcat area, the Yakutat area, because we assumed that he was one of our, and we actually did a stomach analysis and found out that his diet, the most recent diet, he definitely he was living on the coast. Uh, but we were not able to come to terms with uh, the, uh, the, the the um, Native American government at that point in time. Although, I mean, we wanted to do the studies. They didn't want to do the study. But we worked out a compromise that when we would do the study, but then we would be immediately reinsured. Uh, and uh, the we were supposed to have the objects come back for exhibition, but, but that never happened. But uh, it's something that we're, we still continue to try to figure out and we have a group, a delegation coming down where we will raise that issue of the end with them and coming down for the language on it. And it's an unresolved issue. Right? But it, it was really great in terms of we were able to link it to specific Plants, which is something that we're very interested in looking at our different populations and uh, our oral traditions suggest that we come from two different populations, the eagles from one population and the ravens being an older population. And so we have always wanted to do that kind of study and unfortunately that was the one that we never did get the, uh, the findings back on that because we ended up, we identified the individuals who participated in that DNA study? We thought uh, we asked, we went back and looked at their clan membership and the idea of clan and race membership. And the idea was to try to figure out, you know, if in fact we were two different populations uh, and, and if we were able to determine by clan membership. So mm -hmm. that kind of goes into the other kind of area. But a question I wanted to ask is, um, what can you describe epigenetic studies? Uh, describe more fully for us what that is and what the benefits are. Right, yeah. So uh, the question was to describe epigenetic studies. <clears throat> and um, some of the research that we've been involved in lately are epigenetic studies. And so epigenetic studies are studies where it's not based on the DNA sequence, the A, G's, T's, and C's but how the environment that at certain periods of time can uh, mark the DNA that will regulate gene expression to either 
make more of that gene product or less of that gene product. And so there have been studies um, that have been done on uh, Jewish Holocaust survivors. Um, and there's a study ongoing, going on right now with uh, Rwandan uh, Holocaust or the Rwandan survivors of that genocide um, to see if they uh, were, um, had an epigenetic effect of that trauma that happened to them. And so there is a community that I'm working with um, in, in the Kenai area uh, where we are looking at historic trauma uh, and epigenetics of historic trauma to see if uh, forced westernization and the other traumatic effects of boarding schools and other uh, disease and other things that happened when Europeans came over had a genetic, epigenetic effect on individuals. And so we're giving out surveys to um, talk, have, talk about how people feel with historic loss and historic trauma. Um, then we're also um, taking surveys about more recent trauma because we will need to separate the two in the analysis. Um, and then we have an, a historic individual uh, that we have been able to sequence the genome from and we can actually look at epigenetics of the historic individual if just at the time when Europeans came, came over so they wouldn't have had any of the tra traumatic effects. And so we can see if the epigenetic marks on that historic individual are different from the current individuals that show a relationship with historic trauma. Uh, and there's a, um, a student, Kyle Work, uh, who was part of the SYNC program, uh, and it's from the HUNA community, uh, who did a master's thesis on um, uh, historic trauma. Uh, and alcoholism. Uh, and so I was actually talking with him about possibilities of, of doing uh, a similar project in different areas of Alaska. Yes? Have you found a genetic uh, link between clans and moines? Uh, so with some of the... Yeah, so it's, it's possible to, so the question was, do, have we found a link between moieties and genetic differences? So it, it makes a lot of sense to look at the mitochondrial genome since it's, it's maternally inherited and see if it correlates with one clan or another. Uh, so we have not done that research with uh, the, uh, the Co-Simption First Nations, um, but it would definitely be interesting I mean, the, the thing about uh, mitochondrial genomes is uh, because you can now sequence the complete mitochondrial genome, you're not limited to that small segment. You can get a lot more detail from sequencing a small group of individuals. So you are more likely to find uh, any differences now, even with a small group sample. Yeah, that's a great project. I wish the researcher would have returned their results. <laughs> yeah, that's something that has some potential for a lot of uh, useful information. Mm -hmm. At least in the community. Yeah. More able to identify relations and ancestry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be it would be great to do a project like that because I can provide a lot of information. Um, you don't have to worry so much about, uh, so whenever you do genetic research and relate on, that's re associated with relatedness, you sometimes have to worry about non-paternity events. Uh, with mitochondrial genome, there's, there's less of an issue with that because you usually know if... Perfect. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Thank you.